Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Chris Woodfield. Uh, welcome to Low Carbon Devon Inspire Ambition uh, System Shift series of events. Uh, there's a few people connecting on, so welcome. Great to have you with us this afternoon um, to explore leadership for positive change. Um, so, so come in, make yourself comfortable. It'd be great to see some faces if we're able to keep your cameras on and, and see some lovely smiley faces. That'd be awesome. I'm just going to do an intro and then we're going to sort of dive, dive into the event. <clears throat> so as I said, welcome. My, my name's Chris. I work here at the University of Plymouth on the Low Carbon Devon project. I'm really excited to explore some time with you over the next hour or so about leadership for positive change and what is the leadership we need to rise the real world challenges we face um, such as the climate challenge and that's what we're going to explore together so thank you for coming um, it is great great to have you with us on this wonderful autumnal afternoon um, so these series of events are put on by the low carbon Devon team and they're all about bringing people together to explore solutions, to explore themes and ideas around a low carbon future. Um, so today's event is focused on leadership and leadership for positive change. Um, and what an exciting time to be alive. So we are in the run up to, to COP26 in Glasgow. So that's the United Nations Convention of Parties uh, Climate Change Conference. 26 happening in a couple of weeks time at the start of November and this event is sort of in the run up to that where we would really love to explore what is the leadership we need to take action on climate change um, <clears throat> so really excited to do that this afternoon um, it's the first time COP26 is being held in the UK I believe um, some of you may be aware of the Paris Agreement or the Paris Accord, which was um, explored at a previous um, COP event, COP21 in 2015. And so we're really excited that the UK is hosting COP26 in a couple of weeks' time and would be really curious um, to explore today. You know, our leaders are coming together. It's a, it's a meeting of global leaders and heads of state um, to explore how we can build on the Paris Agreement, hopefully, and really catalyze action around climate change. And that's what we're gonna to explore today. But it'd be great to hear who's in the room. So if you're able to um, put who you are in the, in the chat function on Zoom, that'd be really awesome, just to find out who's in the room today and where you're from, um, who you're representing. Um, it'd be awesome to get a flavor of who's, who's here. Um, so please, please do that if you can and you're able to. Um, if you're from a particular business or group or, or representing someone, that would be awesome. We've got five wonderful people lined up to, to speak to us today and to have a conversation. And I'll introduce them in a minute. But um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to you for coming. And also... Um, just give you a brief overview of Low Carbon Devon. So Low Carbon Devon is a project here at the University of Plymouth focused on supporting, empowering, and facilitating local Devon enterprises to, to take action around the low carbon agenda. We are based here at the University of Plymouth within the Sustainable Earth Institute, and we are funded by the European Regional Development Fund. And the project is multifaceted, it's interdisciplinary, it's um, focused on research, but it's also focused on hands-on practical action. And we have a number of ways in which we can take action through the project. Um, one of those is an internship program, and some, some of the interns are on the call today, so, so welcome to you. Um, and that's the internship program is placing current students and recent graduates within local businesses to take action on a low carbon project, but it's also focused on exploring leadership and 
what we're going to be exploring today as well. Um, so I just want to briefly mention that around the Low Carbon Devon project. And if you want to know more about that, um, I'm really keen to chat further about what we do um, in more detail. But for today, really excited to dive in um, to this session. And this session is it going to be exploring is called Leadership for Positive Change. And I'd be really keen to, to hear, as you've just finished um, putting who you are in the chat, I'd really love to just ask you a question as the audience. Um, if you could maybe pick um, two, two qualities or attributes or competencies of what you think a good leader should be or embody or in, encompass to, to rise to, to the real world challenges we face, to rise to the climate challenge, what would those two qualities be? Um, what would a good leader look like for you? And what would those two qualities be? I'd love to just see, see that in the chat if you're able to contribute. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, vision and purpose. I think for me, it would be something around listening, being a good listener and a compassionate citizen. Uh, we've got some more stuff coming through. Thank you. Um, so it'd be really good to see, see some ideas from you and, and our speakers will pick up on those as well. And we'll pick up on that in the, in the chat at the end. So thank you. Some more suggestions coming through. That's brilliant. Um, but for now, let's bring the uh, five wonderful speakers on to this sort of virtual stage <laughs> um, and say hello to them. So we've got um, some wonderful folk joining us. So I just wanted to say hello to our speakers and introduce them and share, if they could share for sort of 30 seconds to a minute who they are, so what they, what they do, and we'll be hearing from them all in detail but just briefly a little overview now. And also what's, what's lighting you up right now? You know, what's either what's, if you could speak to that or also, you know, what, what's one of your favorite things about, about autumn um, as we move into this beautiful time of year. So maybe I could start with um, Rachel. Oh, you're on mute, Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm from the University of Plymouth. Um, I'm a research fellow and I'm currently researching um, Future Leaders Programme. Um, so the lot of my research is based on how we can do best practice in community engaged learning. Um, but similar to the low carbon Devon internships, we run the Future Leaders Programme as well. And I will research uh, my research is looking into best practice. Um, and whether or not these sorts of internships are important to young people and how we can sort of develop the leadership skills that they need. But in doing this, we're sort of researching how this works with the community partners as well. So whether or not sort of these skills and everything are useful for students, but also useful for community partners and, and when they go out and graduate and go into the wider world. Um, I've also finished my PhD at Exeter University um where I was looking at how environmental education can enhance young people's well-being um so I've got a lot of research interest in well-being and spaces and places and, and how we co-create spaces to support young people's development um controversial opinion probably about autumn is that I do actually really like the rain um I live in a house with a tin roof so when it rains it actually sounds really nice and a bit like you're in a tent when you're going to sleep so it's actually really nice <laughs> Ah, oh, sounds lovely. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we'll hear from more from Rachel shortly, but maybe let's um, flow on over to, to Oscar and Will. Hi there. Um, so yeah, we're from Future Shift. We're um, sustainability consultants that specialise in helping businesses uh, go through the, the B Corp process. Um, so yeah, we're, we're based in Bristol. We're helping local Bristol businesses. And we kind of do all of our, our consulting through platform-led consulting um, to kind of make it a lot more accessible for SMEs um, in terms of price point uh, and in terms of value. Um, and then when it comes to autumn, I guess the big advantage is kind of seeing that, that season change, the nature change. Um, and with that comes the kind of gestation period for ideas uh, when it comes to kind of winter, um, which I think is, is quite nice when you're staying in. You have a lot more time to think. 
Awesome. Thanks, Will. What about you, Oscar? What's your favourite? Uh, I'm Oscar, the other half of Future Shift. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with Will with, um, that it's a time for transition and it's a time for change in, in nature. And it's a way to inspire kind of how a society can change as well in terms of sustainability. We're in a time of transition and all of our inspiration really could uh, should be from nature. So they do it best and they do it most beautifully. So it's, it's a good time to sort of reflect and learn. Yeah, awesome. Thank you both. Um, how about Michaela? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michaela. I'm from Stride Reglown Architects. I'm a senior associate architect and passive house designer. And um, I'm actually in our London office. We have nine offices throughout the country, including Plymouth and Truro. Um, I'm the residential lead for London. And I've always been very passionate about sustainability. And uh, uh, last year, when we were in one of the lockdowns, I thought I could add some spare time at the end. So I certified as a passive house designer. And since then, I put together a strategy for the company, uh, which is net zero carbon and passive house strategy. So I'm leading that. Um, I'm upskilling our workforce internally, but also interfacing uh, with the wider industry and trying to get our client, but also all the chain down to uh, the supplier chain to line up with the net zero carbon requirement. And so that's uh, quite a big part of what I'm doing at the moment. Also, I must say, it's not my favorite season. Um, I'm from Italy, so I'm waiting for the sun in summer. Um, I guess it's like the run up to the skiing season, but I don't think it's going to work this year <laughs> as travel is, is not quite uh, um, back uh, 100%, I guess. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Michaela. Um, and yeah, Tom. Yeah, hi, everyone. Nice to see those of you I can see. and. Um, also, hello to anyone watching later in you know, future watches in YouTube world. Um, two things that are lighting me up right now. One, I've just been noticing um, fungus popping up everywhere, mushrooms, um, literally overnight, like absolutely amazing right now. And the other thing that's lighting me up that is also just things popping up is I'm, I'm heading up to Glasgow um, next week for three weeks for the duration of COP to do work there and there is so much energy emerging and so many things popping up around this in the sort of civil society movement it's incredibly exciting um, from business charities activists yeah it's just this surge of energy towards this conference um, so I'm here today um, I mean I'm a freelance facilitator doing many things but I'm here representing Catalista which is a collective I'm part of um, and we our ambition really is to support um, young people or what we're calling Generation 360, which I'll talk about later. Um, yeah, really find their purpose in these times, these really challenging and exciting times, as Chris said. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to exploring that with you. Great. <clears throat> thanks, Tom, and, and thanks to everyone for that intro. Um, really interesting. And... Um, just to add, really, what's lighting me up is um, the wild, the wild sea. Um, I live right by the coast, and it's amazing just watching the waves come through and, and playing in the waves. But when, when also when I'm on land, just getting a face full of sea air um, is is amazing at this time of year. Um, so we'd love to just go flow straight into the talks. So what we're going to do? Everyone's going to going to talk, and then we're going to host questions at the end. If you've got questions that come through, do, do put them in the chat and we can save those for the end. And then we'll have a big discussion at the end after everyone has spoken. So we'll say sort of goodbye to, to the speakers for now, but then start with um, start with Will and Oscar from, from Future Shift, who are going to kick us off. So over to you guys. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's really good to be here. And thank you, Chris and Low Carbon Devon for, for hosting this. Um, I will share our screen um, and we have a presentation for you. Um, hopefully that is uh, going through. If it's not, someone please shout. Yeah. Um, 
Lovely. So today we're going to be speaking about um, the barriers to small business sustainability from, a, from the view of a startup such as us. Uh, I will first be talking about the systemic barrier that we see, and then we'll, um, we'll be speaking about the company level back, uh, barrier. So a bit of background about us. We were born uh, in November of last year. We're based in Bristol, and we like to call ourselves a COVID-driven company uh, because we uh, were kind of looking for things to do. We had a lot of energy to be put into the sustainability sector, but didn't really find an opportunity to place that. So we started Future Shift to really see what we could do in the space. Uh, Will's a marine biologist, and I'm a biotech engineer. So with these science backgrounds, we really love methods and looking at a science-based approach to business sustainability. Um, so yeah, so when we think about the systemic barrier, um, if we look at this article that looks at the five highest rated uh, sustainability ESG companies in, uh, in the UK, um, you can see there's a bit of a disconnect there um, when it's just, just not really true that these are the best, uh, highest performing companies. Um, and that leads us to the question, why, why are these companies the top performers? And the answer we arrived at is that sustainability is not a level playing field. And that's definitely in terms of, um, of money and um, input um, of money that you can put into sustainability. So this is described nicely by um, this graph where on the Y axis, we have the sustainability credentials of a company. So how a company looks um, in terms of sustainability to investors, to funds, to the public and to the government and to the governments and regulatory bodies. And on the X axis, we have the amount of money that a company has to put into sustainability activities and reporting. Uh, there's a positive correlation between the two, which is shown by this arrow. So if we look at the big corporation, uh, the reason that they look so good in terms of sustainability is because they have the resources to put into it. So they have an in-house sustainability team, or they're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, for big, com uh, big um, consulting companies to do all of their auditing and um, reporting. Um, and then we, when we look at the upper end, the larger SMEs, they're paying independent consultants or smaller consultancies up to 800 pounds a day for consulting services to make their companies look sustainability and increase their credentials. But who, who we really want to work with and who we find that our impact is best placed with is people like Susan, who is the head of marketing at a small company, Simon, who's a summer intern, or Sid, the startup owner. And these guys have things in common, such as they have lots of things on their desk. Uh, sustainability is not the only thing that they're thinking about. And they don't have very much um, funding to put into sustainability practices. So they're using Google and free resources to really um, explore what they can within sustainability. Um, so at FutureShift, we believe that this green company space at the top end of the um, sustainability credentials should not be achieved through uh, spending alone. So we're working really hard to uh, change the gradient of this, uh, of this line um, so that we can um, deliver a really high standard of sustainability to smaller companies so that um, high, high level sustainability isn't just reserved for big companies. Um, and how do we do that? Um, we uh, do something that we call platform led consulting, which is where we use technology um, and community approaches to um, provide sustainable reporting and resources at an appropriate price point, but still keeping to that really high value of sustainability that you're seeing in the big corporations. And now Will's going to speak a bit about the company level um, barriers to small business sustainability. Uh, yeah. So when, um, when Oscar and I first started Future Shift, we came in very fresh face. We had no corporate experience whatsoever. Uh, we just had this passion to try and make a difference, to try and make a bit of an impact. Um, but that only really gets you so far. So we did what we do best, kind of as science graduates, and we conducted a bit of research uh, with 50 of the UK's most sustainable companies, uh, which are all B Corps. And Chris, you might recognize one of those companies. Um, we, they're all kind of companies that meet the highest standards of social environmental impact by being B Corps. And from this research period, we wanted to find out what these companies, uh, what barriers they overcame, and how that can possibly influence us moving forward. So I wanted to go over a couple of the companies that we interviewed and kind of the results that we found. Um, and the first company I'm going to talk about is Innocent. 
Now everybody's going to know who Innocent is. They're, they're massive conglomerates. They make tons of money. They're multinational and they make your favorite smoothies and juices. Um, and one day they just decided their CEO turned around and said he's going to be a, Innocent's going to become a B Corp. Uh, he's very forward thinking. He's purpose led. He's actually driving the Better Business Act, uh, which is an act that's trying to regulate um, how sustainability is reported in the UK. Um, but what they struggled with was to really engage the rest of the staff on this journey, um, which we've kind of taken that as you need that wider buy-in. It's okay to have that leader who's going to guide you somewhere, but you need everyone to come on board with you. You need that inclusive decision to be made. Sustainability as a movement in a business will only work when you have everyone on you. Um, and I'll move to uh, the other end of the scale, um, which is an alcohol-free beer company called Freestar Drinks. Uh, and they're a startup based in the UK. And obviously they're very purpose-driven. Um, their whole purpose is to kind of provide a, an alternative to alcohol, alcoholic beer. Um, so when they started, they obviously had tons of experience in, in different sectors, but they had no idea what the norms were in this sector. Um, and they had their experience, they had their knowledge, they had their specialties. But we've kind of taken them from that, that collaboration is key. Sustainability is so wide reaching, it's so holistic that no one can be an expert in everything. And anyone that says that they are, it is just straight up lying to you. Um, it needs that wider network of people to come in and provide that specialisms in different aspects. And then if we kind of look at how society is structured, moving on from that, um, we kind of classically look at it from anthropocentric, anthropocentrical, terrible word to try and pronounce. Um, it's this ego kind of hierarchical look at it where humans are at the top, the rest of the rest of the animals, the ecosystems, they're down the bottom, whereas really it's this interdependent model, um, but we're just a small cog in the rest of it. And that kind of translates into business, because if you look at it classically, you have this heroic model of the big box being at the top, telling everyone what to do, and it trickles down. Um, but nowadays in the modern, modern businesses, for the future looking businesses, the boss is just a little cog. He's just this little cog in this massive wheel, this massive system, um, that plays this part in terms of collaboration. So in terms of how we use this, how are we addressing these barriers that we've been told about, um, it's this wider buy-in. So we want to make sure that everybody and every company that we work with, their job description is changing to include sustainability. And that's one of our main KPIs. It's how many people's job descriptions have we changed to include sustainability. A sustainability movement will only work if you have everybody on board. And then in terms of the barrier of having this holistic sustainability it being so wide reaching, our platform that Oscar mentioned, uh, it focuses on this collaboration through technology to break down these old structures of having this day rate and bringing in these wider experiences of multi-specialisms onto it. Uh, which all really boils down to our mission, which is redesigning sustainability for small businesses. It's redoing all the old norms and bringing in the new norms of today. And I thought I'd leave you today with um, just a quote from old Albert, um, is that we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And that's, that's our presentation. Uh, we'll stop sharing now and then. Uh, yeah, yeah, great guys. Right. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Thank you uh, both. Thanks, Will and Oscar. Really interesting. Um, would it be really cool to pick up on some stuff in in the discussion? Um, but I thought I'd just ask you that maybe just before we move on the, the the question I asked everyone: what you know, what would be that one one or two leadership qualities that that we need to embody? Do you think? So when Will spoke about the, the kind of structure of how we see a business, just like we've seen society for a long time with humans at the top, that is just wrong. It's, it's not correct. So the ability to think in systems, I think somebody mentioned it already, um, is extremely important. And actually recognizing the truth of where humans are in, um, within nature, not apart from it, is, is extremely important, that true realization. And I'd say it's the other half is it's just recognizing, recognizing where you're inefficient and being able to bring on other people and not trying to, to talk about something that you really have no idea about and making sure that you're, you kind of have the best people surrounding you. 
Yeah, cool. Sounds great. Okay. Um, thanks both. We'll um, we'll come we'll explore more of that in the Q and A. But thank you for now, and I think we'll we'll flow straight into our next presenter, which is uh, Michaela. Over over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so if I can share my screen, please let me know if you can see. So today I would like to share with you how the construction industry where I'm working in is addressing net zero carbon through collaboration and knowledge share. Um, and now it uses it, um, its competencies to lead uh, the changes necessary to achieve net zero carbon. We, we recognize that we all play a role in making net zero carbon a reality. It's not just down to consultants like myself, but also our clients, such as developer, contractors, uh, the supply chains, but also council and the government must all play a role in shaping the zero carbon policies and supporting the industry. To, to set the scene, uh, the construction industry responsible for over 40% of the UK total carbon footprint and 22% of which is uh, linked to uh, the operational and embodied carbon footprint of the built environments. Uh, these are data that are, are coming from UK GBC, which is the UK uh, Green Building Council. In, in other terms, the material we use to build our building and their associated carbon and the energy we use to run these buildings account for over 50% of the construction industry impact and overall of the UK carbon footprint, that's a fifth. Um, so that's quite a great impact. That probably sounds quite daunting, but we want to look at this in a positive way, as we know is something we can control and we can have an impact on. So within the construction industry, at the moment, the issue we are facing is that there, there is no uh, unified uh, carbon definition uh, there is no single standard to follow or clear policies and targets, um, although, although progress has been made, but there, is, uh, there are a number of targets and policies and uh, definitions and uh, standards out there. And, but there isn't like a point, um, uh, a point of, uh, of to go to uh, that is, uh, is a unified uh, uh, net zero carbon target and standard. So the industry as a whole is trying to figure out how to achieve net zero carbon, to measure it, how to benchmark our buildings, um, how to benchmark the performance. So instead of being discouraged by the lack of clarity, uh, this has actually uh, brought the construction industry together and we are collaborating in ways we have not seen in the past. Uh, this has been through a number of initiatives and on this uh, uh, page you can see a uh, few of them, but there are many more. Uh, but it's also with high levels of involvement and engagement in uh, government policies consultation. So there are at the moment a number of volunteer initiatives that are promoting uh, knowledge sharing and they are guiding the industry in navigating net zero carbon, uh, definitions, requirement targets. And some of these are uh, the Architects uh, Climate Action Network, uh, LATI that was born uh, among others, it was born as like a London initiative. Uh, since then it's been uh, um, supported and joined by organization throughout the industry. And they've uh, started putting together a lot of uh, guidance that has been picked up across the industry and, and across, uh, across the UK as well. So we're using Lady actually in Somerset and in other in, uh, in projects across the country. Um, there are also um, the industry is supporting proposal for mandatory assessment of all like carbon emission um, and also limitation to the embodied carbon emission. So there is a proposal at the moment uh, um, of uh, adding to the building regulation and other parts of, of it, which is called part set. Um, so which promotes uh, um, the wall life carbon assessment and that's supported uh, by many industry institutions such as uh, RIBA, which is the Architects Board, uh, UKGBC, CBC, Lady, and many others. Um, they're also um, signing up to declaration and pledges um, and to improve uh, the commitment, the, um, 
the industry could make known to net zero carbon. Uh, and finally, there's been um, a lot of engagement in government's consultations. And um, I think the industry has felt that what the government was putting forward was not up to the net zero challenge. So the industry has kind of like joined forces in getting back to the government and, um, and the consultation that we're putting out there, for example, for future home standard, future building standard, uh, building regulation portal, uh, which deals with uh, conservation of fuel and power, um, so that we can, uh, all these policies can be reviewed and the construction industry can have an input in that. And we can have uh, policies that would help define the built environment performance with regards to net zero carbon. And finally, talking about what we do as a company, uh, we do collaborate, but we also lead by example, and we are doing so on a number of different levels and taking a number of different steps. So we do that through certification. So we are a big corporation uh, and we also become carbon neutral this year. So we assess uh, uh, scope one, two and some of the scope three, and we will continue to assess that going forward. Uh, we are signatory of pledges such as the 2030 and the architect declares, and we are embracing uh, the uh, in, in regards to what we need to do uh, with our projects going forward and uh, embracing at zero carbon. We also upskilling our workforce. So internally through uh, part of my work is upskilling uh, people in net zero carbon and passive house knowledge, but also externally through formal certification. And then by promoting net zero carbon developers and investors, which are our clients, but also um, going further than that, assisting contractors with delivering these requirements. Uh, we promote partnership with other consultants that have uh, um, similar view on, net, on achieving net zero carbon um, and engaging with supply chain, which is probably the weakest link uh, uh, at this moment in time. And it's kind of like follow up and being dragged along. And, and finally, contributed to the industry debate with case studies, so showcasing our projects with opinion pieces during events such as today. Uh, we've done uh, quite a string of events and we are coming to um, the end of it. And it's uh, eight week, uh, week programs we have done in the run up to COP26, which is called the Climate Action Relay. So we have started from our offices in uh, Plymouth and Truro, and then we've gone uh, up from office to office and promoting uh, zero carbon and uh, um, engaging with the wider construction industry and sparking the debate. Um, and we are doing quite a lot as a, as a construction industry, and it is a great starting point where we are. And it's great to see a lot of a high level of engagement uh, throughout it, but um, much more need to be done if we are we want to achieve net zero carbon by 2050. So if I can leave you with one message today, um, I guess that is collaboration plays a fundamental role in leadership and we can't push all this massive agenda forward by ourselves, but we need all to collaborate to make the most of it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Michaela. I really love that finishing on the um, piece around collaboration in terms of, you know, leading by example, but also that goes hand in hand with collaboration. Um, a quick question similar to you. I, I don't know if you'd say collaboration, but what, what would be the, the sort of lead, the one or, the one or two leadership um, quality that you think we need? Would it be collaboration? It would be collaboration. I think as architects, we are prone to be collaborative. It's part of our job, but also being adaptive. So I've been working in London for almost 20 years in the construction industry. And I've been, uh, I've been shaping my career in different ways. So, for example, passive house, I consider it um, 20 years ago, it wasn't something that was uh, mainstream at the time, but I didn't park it. And now that it's uh, mainstream, we are embracing it more. Uh, we know that it's now um, acknowledged uh, by the uh, construction industry. That is something that is uh, making a positive impact on, uh, on our life, on our buildings. So it's looking 
for what is new and adapting to our environment. Um, so that's probably one of the other um, skills that well, a good leader should have. Yeah, that's great. I love it. Collaboration and adapt, adapt, adaptive, adaptable. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We'll flow straight on to, to Rachel, who's going to be speaking next. Um, so, Rachel, over to you. Hi, thank you. Can you see my screen all right? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, really interesting talk from everyone previously. Thanks for that. Um, so I'm going to come at a slightly different angle, probably. Um, so I'm going to offer sort of a think piece to begin with and then feed into how this has sort of shaped some of the work that we've been doing at the university. Um, so one thing to think about when we're talking about leadership and the sort of people that we want to develop as leaders is what are we developing leaders for? So we live in a very fast and changing world. There's so much going on and there's so much thrown at young people. Um, so what, what sort of people do we want to create and how do we create these sort of young people without sort of putting an indoctrination of this is what young people need to go out there and work with the businesses that are doing the important work like people have just been talking about. So I'd like everyone to just look at this quite quickly and just think about Vision without action is useless, but action without vision does not know where to go or why to go there. Vision is absolutely necessary to guide and motivate action. But more than that, vision, when widely shared and firmly kept in sight, brings into being new systems. So it's places like this where it's so important, where we get such a different variety of people to come together and share what that vision is. So one thing I want people to think about next quickly is is going to change, is what is your vision of the future? So I want you to imagine two pictures. The first picture is what is the probable future? So imagine how you think the future will look in 100 years based on the world today. And then the second picture I want you to imagine is how would you like the future to look in 100 years? So this is what we call your preferable future. Um, if you could put that in, um, put some of the ideas and the pictures you're getting up into the chat so people can begin to see what we're thinking, thinking about. So I'll give you a quick sort of 30 seconds to just brainstorm ideas and put them in the chat quickly. If anyone would like to sort of, sort of say out loud their ideas, that would be great as well, just to have a bit of a a bit of a discussion about it. I'm gonna go. Yeah, thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, I reckon in terms of pref, did you say the probable or preferable or both? Or both, whichever one. Maybe something around more equal and sort of connected societies um people so more of a sort of yeah you know happy flourishing communities but are centered on more yeah more sort of equality yeah brilliant okay because we don't have too much time what i want sort of people to begin to think about when thinking about these certain sorts of futures is what things do we need to change to get to your preferable future? So how do we get leaders that can move away from the probable future that we're heading towards, but more towards the preferable future? How would your future influence society? So how much would society need to change to actually get to this future that you're thinking about is important to you? What important policies would you put in place to get to that future? And a really important one here is how does your preferable future fit alongside somebody else's? So I don't know how many people there's sort of in sort of watching this at the moment, let's say maybe 20, 30. Everybody could have a different vision of what the future is. So everybody's going to be working towards their own future. So how do we then come together to develop leaders that can create that future together, but with everybody's own cultural and social and historical, historical background in mind? So one of the things we're thinking about is moving away from the lone expert figure towards a murmuration of co-created change. So you can see here there's this sort of lone bird floating around away from this main group here, but that's not the sort of future leaders that we want. We want leaders to be integrated within the whole bird setting. It's a bit of a loose sort of term there. But how do we all sort of fly towards that future together, taking into, taking into account everybody's images of the future, everybody's understandings, everybody's knowledge? 
And that's the sort of future leaders that we are probably aiming to, to want. So everyone can take into account everyone's knowledge. You have to understand people's backgrounds. And one example of this, so um, to add a little bit of context to this, um, my undergraduate was in education studies, and then I did a master's in education for sustainable development. And part of that program, which sounds familiar because I now research the Future Leaders Program, but I was a participant on the Future Leaders Program and then also did my master's research on the Future Leaders Program whilst I was a participant on it. And it was really interesting at what people were saying about it. And one of the really interesting quotes that stuck with me is working with people from other courses was really useful. It made it easy to understand different aspects of sustainability. People would put in more economic and social aspects that weren't really obvious to me because I was so focused on the environmental. It took me a while to see the importance of them as well because I was so narrow minded before. So again, this is going back to the fact that people have their own sort of views of what sustainability is in their heads. So this particular person was on environmental science. So they were viewing sustainability as an environmental problem and because they hadn't been opened up to sort of different other views of sustainability, such as economic sustainability or social sustainability, they didn't sort of have that understanding of it before. And then when you begin to develop programs where we can bring students together to get a broader view of what sustainability is, they were able to understand that actually when we want to tackle sustainability, there's a sort of systems thinking approach that we need to understand. So we need to understand sort of the environment, the, environment, the economic and the social aspects. So you could have people in this, these two pictures here from maybe engineering and those sort of natural sciences sorts of things come together. And that's when we begin to develop well-rounded students to tackle sustainability problems. And then we began to ask them to think about what makes a sustainable graduate. So it was a student's perspective of what they need to be a sustainable graduate and go on and graduate and do future leaders programs and projects and sort of answer the world's problems. And one of the ones that really stuck with me that they came up the most and everyone always discussed about was hope. So as we all know, the world is facing a lot of different problems now and it's bombarded all over the media. But how do we keep young people, young people having hope and they want to go out there and help and they actually have the belief that they can make the change themselves. And another quote that came up from this research was again from a student on environmental science. And she was saying how she lost hope for a while. And this was one young student that was so engaged the whole time and she always seemed like she had so much to offer towards sustainability. Then when we sort of had this chat during my research, she actually said she'd become so disengaged with sustainability because she'd lost hope. So all, all, all of her modules, all they were doing was saying, there's this problem with the world, there's this problem with the world, there's this problem with the world, there's this problem with the world. And no module or no sort of lecturer on that module was offering her any hope that there could be a solution to it. And there was just so much put on to this young person that she just didn't know what to do with it. And she was like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. So as, as sort of people who could be developing young people or looking for graduates, how can we keep young people's hope alive? That is such an important sort of skill that young people need. And they know it as well. They know that need, they need to have hope to keep them working towards sustainability. Another one was knowledge. They need to have well-rounded knowledge that is situated in all different sorts of places. Have they got good communication skills as well? We need to make sure that we don't have students that are just so used to sitting and thinking about theory and writing essays and sort of having this really theoretical approach to understanding things, but can they then go and communicate these in real world businesses, such as the ones that you are from? Uh, you know, how many times do you have a graduate that maybe doesn't have those good communication skills? Can they write a simple email and just be able to get across what they're saying really easily and effectively? Critical thinking skills as well. Can they critically explain explore things? Are they able to take into account everyone else's perspectives as well as keeping their perspective in their minds as well? That's the only way we can move things forwards. So it's a real balance between attaining their own common good but, but fulfilling personal desires and aspirations at the same time as we've got these local, national and global citizens. And leadership skills. Now I appreciate leadership skills in the context of this is quite a broad, a broad thing to say. But we need to understand, first of all, what these leadership skills might look like. And this is where we need to think about what is the future going to look like and what are we going to what are we going to lead towards? And creativity. So creativity and hope and all of these things sort of go hand in hand. So they have the hope that they can use their creativity skills to actually develop answers to future problems and, and answers to sustainability problems. So I'm just going to quickly sort of talk about sort of research that we're doing at the moment. 
Um, so at Plymouth University, we have, we have the Plymouth Compass, um, which has got four key points that we have initially considered that Plymouth graduates should have, Plymouth graduates graduate should have. So this was developed quite a while ago by students and staff. And so the four key points are they should be a crea creative and critical learner, um, a resilient and thriving individual, a sustainable and global citizen, and a competent and confident professional. So this is quite old, but it's still something we use to frame around to think about what, what graduates should have. And my current research at the moment is actually thinking about, do we need to redesign this sort of competency framework um, for a future that is more relevant to young people? So maybe seven years ago, I think this was first designed. Um, but now do we need to update this? And, and when we think about how we're going to update it, what sort of skills do the young people need now? Um, so I'm going to be working with, um, with academic staff, with community organisations and students to think about actually what skills they need to go out with when they graduate and, and what do community organizations and what do SMEs need from the graduates that they can have to be, be leaders in their organizations. Um, so if you can then have another think about, like Chris asked before, is, is what sort of skills do you think young people need? Um, maybe write it down a bit more or just keep it in your head and we can discuss it a bit more later on. But it's this whole thing about, thing about creating vision and hope for the young people um, to be aspiring leaders for sustainability. And that's where I think I'll finish. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And what a beautiful picture that is. <laughs> the final one there. And um, just to add, so we're using the Plymouth Graduate Compass um, as part of the Low Carbon Devon Internship Programme. Um, I think I mentioned at the beginning. And um, to explore, like Rachel said, is it still... Is it still relevant? Do we need to update it? How can we build on this framework? Um, so thank you for highlighting that, Rachel. Really interesting to hear. Um, what would you pick if you could pick one leadership quality that you think we should all have or our leaders need to embody? Um, I think um, some imagination. I think uh, the problems that we are faced with now means that we need to think outside the box a bit more and, and sort of develop our imagination skills to be able to solve some bigger problems. Yeah, awesome. Me too. <laughs> um, I think there's a, one of my favourite sort of things I keep in mind, you know, if we can't create a more beautiful world, if we can't imagine it first. Um, so, so totally love that. And um, would, would love to pick, pick up on more of that in the discussion. Um, but thank you. Um, we'll, flow, we'll flow straight over to the final speaker. Um, Tom, over to yourself. Are you there, Tom? Yes. Over to you, Tom. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to zoom out a little bit more. Thanks, Rachel, for widening the context. And I want to really contextualize this discussion around leadership in, in this moment, in the wider view of both time and community. And you know, this moment being a critical moment around climate challenge and like Chris said perhaps one of the most overwhelming times to be alive but also the most exciting times to be alive and so I wanted to pose this question to start with um, about are we being good ancestors and this is a question posed by Yuna Salk back in the um, early 90s who was an immunologist exploring like what do we do with scientific knowledge in a responsible way at this time. So I want to just, yeah, explore that context. Um, you know, what is it that we're, we're setting up at this time? And what does that mean for us as leaders and for future leaders as well? So I want to just invite you um, to remember that you've got a body to start with. Um, and just to see if you can find your pulse for a moment, maybe on your wrist, on your neck, and just feel the beating of your heart in your body. So I want to just connect in with our ancestors and really this, this ability to pump fluids around our body comes from um, the first multicellular organisms in the primordial ocean. And sometime later, um, by our ancestors way back, the worms that um, evolved a heart to pump that around their bodies. So you're feeling that ancestry in you. And then just moving your hands up and giving your neck a little massage, often when we're on screens too much, 
you know, we can get quite sore necks. And just feeling the amazing structure of your spinal cord, um, your spinal column even, hopefully not your spinal cord, because you've got this um, incredible ingenious design that's solid yet flexible to protect our spinal column. Um, designed by our ancient ancestors, the fish, again in the ocean, so they could move fluidly and it allows us now to walk and dance and sit and do all the things that we do. Um, but also then just to look at your hands. So just take a moment to look at the absolute marvel that is your hand that allows us to do so many things, not just tap a keyboard, um, but many, many other things. And if you just put your thumb and your forefinger together, um, you'll notice that the gap there is big enough to hold a branch that will support our own weight. Uh, well, that's because it was designed by our primate ancestors to be able to swing through the trees. But we've climbed down out of the trees and we've had a long journey to get to where we are today. And that, that journey is something that I want to explore a little bit. And I'm just going to invite you to really listen in with all of the senses that we've received from our ancestors. So not just download stuff that you already think you know or that agrees with you, but really open your mind to new data, open your heart to other perspectives. And if you can, open your will to what is wanting to emerge at this time um, of multiple crisis. So we have been on this long, bumpy journey, like this is 100,000 years of human time, and this is climate signals through that time. It has not been an easy ride. And the world as we know it now has really, you know, come to be in the last 10,000 years, um, the Holocene, where we've had this incredibly unusually stable climate. And so I wanted to just explore the last little bit, like where are we right now? And I want to do this through some of my ancestors. So just to introduce you to my grandmother, who was born in the 20s, um, into an atmosphere of about 305 parts per million of carbon dioxide. My dad, 30 years later, 310 parts per million. Myself, 30 years later in 1980, 338 parts per million. And then my nephew, um, born in 2010, uh, into a world of 390 parts per million. So between me and my nephew, we crossed this threshold um, from safe zone into, into the danger zone of, of climatic change. And I want to just think about the fact that there was a generation born around that shift um, that I'm calling Generation 360. They were born into a world um, where we were moving rapidly through see, 360 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And these are the young people now stepping towards leadership into your businesses, into your fields of work. They were also born into a time of incredible acceleration and terrifying trends, both socioeconomic and earth system trends. Um, and this is the, the place that they are set to become uh, leaders in. This is the world that they are facing. And right now, we are reaching this historic moment with COP26, where decisions are being made, you know, and the projections when you actually look at the pledges that are being made um, are that we're actually um, headed for a world, even if things are done as they say they're going to be done, um, for a 2.7 to 3.1 degree um, Celsius rise. Um, and that's a, probably a conservative estimate. And this is an unthinkable world. So really, we're, we're talking about young leaders that are coming into a world um, positioning leadership really between the unthinkable uh, and the impossible. So what, what can we do to actually reach the impossible? Uh, and this is where another hockey stick trend comes in that I want to share that gives a little bit of that, that hope, not just something that we have, but something that we can do. And that's how I want to define hope. It's something we do. Because research, and this is Frederick Lelou's research, has looked at how organisations have shifted over time. And there's a rapid shift away from sort of military, um, machines, and even family, you know, orientated, if we think about metaphors, the way that we organise towards something much more akin to living systems, which has already been touched on. And so it's this increase as we move into the living systems approach or the teal um, level of consciousness or organising where trust um, is increased and actually engagement and results increase. So if we think about this world, and we've seen this image already, as we move away from this hierarchical structure, um, we don't just see the fields we work in as um, places where we have products all the time. You know, this is an actual field with product, but we actually pay much more attention to um, the soil of those fields, whether they're physical fields or social fields or 
economic fields. And so really the leadership that we're exploring at Catalista is how to support Generation 360 um, through awareness-based leadership. This is leadership where we do pay attention to the soil. We pay attention to the internal conditions, the relationships um, that actually allow our social fields to, to function. And to do that, we give value to pausing, pause in response, pause in reflection, um, and actually slow down a little bit in this urgent time. We give huge value to listening, both listening inwardly and outwardly, um, allowing ourselves to really presence what's happening right now in order that we can make good, caring, compassionate decisions for ourselves and for others. And that puts well-being right at the centre of our leadership. And that, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that productivity actually increases when we pay attention to these things. This is also something then that really gives value to the whole. And we talk about emergence and complexity in these systems where we see ourselves as part of the whole and all of the work we do as part of the whole. And that this brings this level of purpose to what we do and that we can turn up as humans as we are authentically into our work. And as these times become increasingly chaotic as they will, whatever happens at COP26, um, there also has to be this huge element of nonviolence in, in leadership. So justice and compassion being at the center of, of everything we do. So the work we're doing with young people really is drawing on some of these amazing thinkers, the research and the practice um, that we can offer to Generation 360. And, you know, the real advocates who care about intergenerational justice are the ones that are easy to see because they are, you know, acting um, out their answers to Jonas Salk's question. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, really lovely to hear some beautiful quotes there. Um, and yeah, awesome. Thank you. It reminded me of um, something I was thinking about just today, actually, around slow is fast. And when we slow down, we become more present and feel ourselves here rather than trying to get somewhere else. Um, so thank you for that reminder. <laughs> um, I'd love to open up the discussion and sort of bring everyone else onto the onto the stage as well and explore explore leadership for positive change in a bit more detail. Um, so if we can invite uh, Rachel, Will and Oscar and Michaela back onto the stage as well, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you to Hayley, my colleague who's working in the background as well. Um, big, big shout out and thank you to Hayley Holt. Would love to hear some questions from the audience. If you have any questions, um, do pop them in the chat or raise raise your hand and we can we can make that happen. I've got a few questions, but yeah, do you think of some questions either for a particular speaker or for for all of us to explore? Um, I wanted to kick off with a question actually around we we've talked about COP twenty um, six happening in a couple of weeks time and the importance of that. Some of us might be going, some of us might be watching from afar. Some of us might even, even just have learned about it today. But I was wondering for each of our speakers, you know, if you had an hour with those world leaders, what would you do? What would you tell them? What would you precipitate in an activity? Would you run a workshop? What, what would it be? Um, what would you say to them? Um, maybe following up from, from the final speaker, Tom, what, could you speak to that, please? I am going to be there and I would love that opportunity. Um, I'll be hanging outside the blue zone in, in Glasgow waiting for that hour. Um, I really wanted to touch on um, Rachel's point about hope. Um, because this is something really central to a lot of the work that I do. And there was, I know I whizzed through some slides, but this book, Active Hope, um, that I work with a lot. And I would go, and I'm going to be doing many workshops through this time for the civil society movement during COP. Um, but I would do a, 
an active hope process um, with those delegates because the delegates, world leaders, we're all people and these people are also going to be feeling this moment. And I think there's such importance in giving space. And this is, you know, for me very much, you know, about this awareness-based leadership is giving space to the feelings that emerge. And it's not just the thoughts. It's not just our rational minds. And this is part of stepping back towards a holistic leadership approach. And so I would move through this process of grounding ourselves in gratitude, actually facing and sharing and opening to some of the feelings that really emerge around this challenging time that we all share. Um, and then allowing ourselves to shift some perspectives um, that allow us then to step towards action and feel energized. And that, that that is our active hope. It's something we do. It's not something we have. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. I look forward to hearing if you manage to, to make that happen. Um, we'd love to be part of that as well. Um, what about anyone else? Uh, Oscar and Will, I saw you nodding then. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, so coming, um, building on your, your comment, Chris, that um, going slow and slow is, slow is more in a lot of ways. I think I would try to sit in silence with these leaders for 55 minutes and then in the last five minutes of our time together discuss something that was on their mind and something that came up in their inner thoughts. I think teaching people to look inwardly lets us access something that's greater than ourselves and allows us to be within the systems that we, that we live in and actually understand them for what they are. So I think this silence approach, uh, taking a step back and looking at things in its entirety at the whole, rather than the small tasks that you have for that day is, is, is hugely valuable. So that's what I would do. And I'd have a, a slightly less, less deep, <laughs> response to them um, and kind of hope to hope to teach them a little bit about what greenwashing is um, and hold them a little bit more accountable to what they're saying I guess um, a lot of what Boris says doesn't seem to be uh, actualized in his his green energy his new climate regime that's what we go for yeah awesome sounds good um okay like what, what about yourself uh, I guess it's probably, and I'm looking at this uh, uh, with the eye of uh, like a construction industry, having a more holistic approach. Uh, so there have been in the past and they have announced uh, some other uh, green support measures, but they're looking at specific items. So for example, for retrofitting homes, uh, there is an holistic view of retrofitting the homes. So the homes is like performing well and it's, uh, it's not uh, contributing to the uh, carbon emissions but just tackling a small item at a time, which might actually have like a negative in, uh, effect on the performance of the building itself. So definitely an holistic approach. And uh, we can look at Europe on, on that uh, in, in that respect. And there are a lot of uh, uh, different initiatives in Germany, in Italy, uh, that look at uh, building as an holistic approach rather than just chucking some money to a boiler uh, to avoid having a boiler and uh, uh, putting a heat source pump instead. Uh, so just looking at the problem holistically. So that's for the construction industry, but that's applied to all other sectors, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Sounds cool. Thank you. Um, and yeah, Rachel, we've got some questions come through in the chat and I'll, we'll take those in a minute, but what would you do if you had um, an hour with, with those people at COP26? Um, yeah, I mean, that's quite a good question, really, isn't it? Because there's a lot of things that you could probably want to do there. Um, but I would probably say um, encourage them to listen to everyone else's voices. Um, and I guess through a lot of my research, the methodologies I use are actually we need to um, pay attention to the, the people's voices that matter and sort of take a step back from our own voices. Um, and once we listen to everybody else, that's when we kind of are, are leading towards that collective goal. Um, and if they're not understanding the voices and listening to everyone else, that's kind of they say they see us sitting below them is is how on earth do they know what we all want? Um, are they prioritizing their voice, everyone else's voices, or are they just listening to their to their own voices go round that room over and over again without actually sort of knowing knowing the difference that they could be making to support everybody else? 
Yeah, great. <laughs> I love it. And I love that importance of, yeah, listening and listening beyond. Listening internally, listening, um, I think quite a few of you mentioned it, listening internally, but also listening outwardly um, in a way which is compassionate and, and empathetic and active. Um, you know, listening is a, is a skill that we, that we need to practice, I think. Um, would love to take some questions. Um, I've got a question come through from, from Sol. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I think it kind of stems from looking at um, I think one of the first slides that uh, Oscar and Will brought up about the, the ESG um, kind of top rated companies and you kind of see Coca-Cola and the people that are kind of obviously not great in terms of their kind of environmental sort of standpoints and things like that. And people that really have got great governance um, and, uh, and spend loads of money on sustainability, but obviously not enough uh, to, for, the, for the damage that they do. So, uh, is it that some industries are just inherently unsustainable? And um, I guess really, would, would you guys look to work with um, people that are sort of like in the oil industry or ones which are, would you see that as kind of like the challenge to be like, okay, how sustainable could you get it? Or would you kind of not engage with them at all and just sort of say, look, that's about they need to kind of make progress in, in other ways and focus on maybe startups or other people that have got sustainability uh, as their core principles from the outset? Yeah, great question. So, um, so I think like if, to start answering this, we'd like if we look at like the definition of sustainability, it is the ability to do something forever, um, and we need to work within nature, within like the buffering capacity of nature. There is a budget that nature gives us in terms of carbon, in terms of plastic and things like that, um, and we just can't um, live outside those limits to our um, to our function as as society um and the question about um whether we've worked with an oil company that would be um in my wildest dreams i like um i would really uh i would like to do that and the reason is that these companies are looking at themselves uh in the wrong way and there are examples of oil companies that have been oil companies and have gone on to transition within 10 years to to new energy systems. If we don't look at them as oil companies, we look at them as energy providers, then it, you start to see that they actually have got a possibility for transition and change. Um, oil companies cannot exist in a hundred years time, um, but energy companies will exist in a hundred years time. And that's the sort of transition that we have to, have to look at on an industrial level. So yeah, in short, would love to work with oil, oil companies and um, every every um, every company can be can be sustainable, and we don't have to sort of we don't have to take a hit somewhere. That's that's not um, it's it's not something we have to do. Um, yeah, yeah well, just uh, just on top of that, the with working with someone like the oil company, um, the higher their impact is, the the more ability you have to kind of reduce their impact. I think it's something like the top 100 companies in the world are responsible for 90% of the world's emissions. Um, so if you could just kind of manage that slightly um, and address it kind of top down a little bit, um, that, that would be the dream to kind of work with them. There's, there's so much action you can do from the bottom and working with SMEs is a, is a great way to start. Um, but to realise this actual change, it is going to have to come from the top. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks, Will and Oscar. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I really agree. It's that combined approach, isn't it? Of sort of, yeah, everyone, the bottom up and top down and working with a whole host of different, um, um, whole host of different organisations and engaging, the pro engaging with the process because I'm sure there's lots that you might be able to learn from them as well as um, you could give them. And um I think just being open to that would, would be amazing. Um, I noticed, Jonathan, you've got your hand raised. Was that on a particular point? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up. I think there's quite a few things that uh, I found really interesting and a few statements that have been made. And, and I suppose one of the most interesting presentations I found was Rachel. Um, and I think I've been 
fortunate enough to have quite a broad experience, work experience um, across the world in various industries as well. Um, and there was something Oscar or Will um, mentioned around oil companies can't exist in the next hundred years, which goes back to the original question from Saul around um, are some things fundamentally unsustainable? And, and to, to say that oil, um, oil companies can't exist because they can transfer to other energies. Um, I think we're probably being a bit short-sighted that oil is the foundation of everything, of, of our lifestyles. Um, you know, everything, computers. Now, if we're moving to, everything is computer-based nowadays. Information is managed on computers. That's all created through products made through oil. How would you create electronics and, and things if, if, if we didn't have that, uh, what other alternatives are there? What what can we make PCBs from in the future, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so we're gonna have to, I don't know, the way I see, you know, when you ask that question around, what do we think it's gonna be or, or, or what's the reality or what would we like to see? You know, hopefully uh, in a more realistic kind of um, view, oil companies would exist purely to do those things that we can't do we can't find other alternatives to do so it 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 ekes out what we have it uses what we have in, in a lot better way because we're finding alternatives to oil-based products i think is probably something a little bit more realistic around the way we should be thinking um certainly in the short term and i think we probably have to um, start preparing people for um, a huge change in, in lifestyle expectations. You know, I think one of the things I said around, we're going to have less ability to enjoy the world in the future. You know, we're going to go back to the dark ages where tr personal transport is, is not available to everybody. Therefore, we're not going to be able to enjoy the world anyway, apart from what's on our doorstep. Um, because, Again, creating electricity, our whole world relies on electricity, you know, unless we find other alternatives other than oil. So I think, you know, while there, there's a lot of aspirational and idealistic um, sort of views, I think the fundamental thing is we're going we're gonna to have to change our lifestyles or, or the human race is going to, it may not happen in our lifetimes, but um, lifestyles fundamentally would have to change in the future to be that you know, return the earth to, to nature kind of thing, I think. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, it was there. <laughs> that's all right. Awesome. Yeah, good to hear from you. And um, I you know Tom's got your hand up, but maybe I'll just jump back to, to Oscar and then we'll go to Tom. Yeah, yeah, if, if I could uh, say some words on that. Um, when, I, when I said oil companies can't exist, I, I meant that oil companies, as we see them today as they are structured today cannot exist um, and I completely agree with you um, that oil companies should exist to serve the things that can't be decarbonized and there are lots of things that oil companies do now such as energy that can be decarbonized and yeah. contributing um, towards yeah those those un undecarbonizable sectors uh, is is what we have to do and then that changes the whole idea of what an oil company is there will probably be, there will most likely be a shell and a bp in a hundred years time but what they look like if we've succeeded in our project of sustainability um they will look completely different um to how they do today and yeah if i if i come back to the very very first question that's what you would like that's what we would like to show to an oil company that there is a hundred year plan where they do exist and they have not fought against the project of sustainability or survival, but worked with it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Oscar. Um, Tom, can I bring you in? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up a few of these threads and it also leads into Ali's question. Um, yeah, sort of, sort of what you were asking about, you know, or how would we feel about working with oil companies in this sort of way? And I feel there's a huge amount of work to do around social sustainability in the transition that we are facing. Because my sense of COP is, you know, if, if the decisions that are made at COP are truly 
radical enough to get us out of the situation that we face, which is catastrophic. Let's make absolutely no bones about it. Like we are facing a catastrophic future if we keep on the trajectory we're on. There has to be a rapid, hard cutting transition, but that transition has to be just. And this just transition is absolutely fundamental. And that will be just towards workers in the oil sector, but it will also be just towards people in the global south. And I think, you know, to widen our view on this, not just, you know, about business on, on these islands or in the global north, but the, the just transition for people. And this is where, for me, sustainability comes right into the heart. And also, you know, how do we engage with people who are, are neutral or aggressive towards these changes? I'll take that as, as your question, Ellie. And, and this is where these leadership attributes of, of awareness are so critical you know we need to be able to hear people across difference without jumping to judgments and othering people and creating blame and confrontation because that will very very quickly lead to conflict and in conflict situations you're not going to get the solutions that we all need to survive uh, and it will lead and I think I saw this in in other people's response it will lead to to war and it will lead to yeah, very violent situations and the breakdown of society. So these are absolutely fundamental. They're not just nice to have people skills. They're critical in these times. Yeah, thanks for adding that in, Tom. Um, there's, and thanks for signposting to Ellie's question. Um, I was wondering if maybe what would... Um, I'd be curious, actually, to bring um, Michaela in here in terms of, you know, would would you work as as Stride Tr Triglown in a in a business which is trying to reduce its impact on the environment? Um, you know, do you work with people that that share, that don't share those values? You know, do you, in terms of your clients that you work with, are you do you make a decision? You know, in terms of we're only going to work with companies that are. That have that share that your values or as we've been discussing with do you also work with people that you see that you can influence change we work with everyone and i think it's even more important that we do work with people that don't share our values in the same way uh, oscar and will would work with an old company is because we can influence them so for us the um big biggest uh probably obstacle is costs. So uh, a lot of the conversation at the beginning of projects um, picks up all the sustainability that everyone around the table might be willing to explore it and, uh, uh, and go forward with sustainable solutions. And then when it comes to costing a project, that's when the problem starts. So a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment is demonstrating that uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, solutions that they are just in design or we design things that don't cost more, but also the values that we can add in sustainability. So, for example, for clients that retain assets, it means that they cost less to run. Yes, there is an investment at the beginning, but they also have like a, um, at the moment they can have a, uh, for example, access to a loan from banks that they wouldn't have if they weren't uh, um, pursuing sustainable uh, developments. Uh, so there are a number of, uh, of initiatives there are throughout the industry, so from uh, investors uh, down to the supply chain that uh, um, are helping making our case. Of course, it's never simple, and there are a lot of steps backwards. Um, so we're doing pilot projects, for example, a lot of uh, the work we are doing in sustainability is driven by public sector because everyone has declared a climate emergency. Um, so they are willing more to explore what they need to do after declaring the uh, climate emergency, what's the actual practical step then to go forward. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's a mixed bag, but definitely there are a lot of conversation going on and we do a lot of presentation and a lot of discussion also because there isn't clarity on uh, their own policies. So people don't actually know what they need to do. Um, but we, we see a lot of companies and for example, which was surprising to, to us contractors that you would think are, you know, possibly not the strongest link in the 
in the construction industry, you would think like the developers or the uh, final occupier would be the driver, but they are driving uh, policies within the organizations uh, uh, to drive uh, for net zero carbon. They recognize that they can't just ignore it anymore. So they might as well embrace it. And I think that's very important because that means that we got allies within the construction industry that work with us. Mm. Cool, yeah, no, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's, that's great to hear because I think that's one of the, I think I might mention at the beginning about just embracing embracing it, um, you know, and being open to to say like, I don't know the answer, but let's figure out it together. Um, and sort of embracing that uncertainty. Um, I'd really have to hear from from everyone. I I wanted to, I was toying with exploring. You know, is there is events around leadership for positive change? And is there? It'd be great to hear from each of you around. Is there? You know, I asked at the beginning around leadership qualities or attributes or or competencies. You know, do you have a leader in your mind that inspires you? that you could share, whether it's in the public realm or whether it's, you know, someone you work with or inspires you on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd love to hear from, um, maybe let's go around and start with Rachel. Well, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this one. <laughs> um, but actually, I don't think he's here, so that's good. But it's actually um, Paul Warwick. Um, I've been lucky enough that Paul has sort of been fighting my corner um, and sort of introduced me to the concept of sustainability um, when I was on my undergraduate um, and without his sort of direction and, and I think ways of thinking about sustainability I probably wouldn't be sat um, in the chair I'm sat in now and doing the things that I'm sat in now. Um, he sort of guided a lot of a lot of the way I think about sustainability and society um, to the point where I went to an interview once um, and I was ask, answering questions about um, obviously for the job and they said gosh you sound a lot like Paul Warwick. <laughs> um so yeah he, yeah Paul is probably someone that has inspired me to do a lot of the work that I've done oh that's good to hear and, and Paul, just for everyone else in the room Paul is um one of our colleegues in a, in a university lecturer here at the University of Plymouth uh, but we won't tell him that Rachel said that um, <laughs> um Oscar and Will what about you I'm gonna go really cliche here but it sort of explains a point that I want to make. So I'm going to say Greta Thunberg. Um, and I do understand that it's, it's a big cliche, but it, it brings me to a point about hope. And we've, we've spoken about hope and I, this is an open, open question as well, um, but I'd like to challenge that with what Greta sort of brings to the table, where she brings anger and action uh, into it, where as she would, I, I think she would think that hope is, is a bit defeatist, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, and that we need our leaders to be anti-establishment. We need them to have a complete dissatisfaction with the status quo. They need to um, really want change and not be happy with what we have right now. But I would like to um, hear from Tom and Rachel about your definition of hope and whether Greta embodies any of that for you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's actually a really interesting point. And I often grapple with this in a lot of the work I did with environmental education and, and well-being for young people. Because a lot of what sort of we think about is actually what is environmental education and what, what is the purpose of it? Is Should we kind of be inspiring young people to take their own path to sort of um, having an attachment to the natural environment? Or should it be a form of indoctrination because it's too late? So should we be educating in a manner where it's like, you should be thinking like this because it's way too late to be thinking with, in any other way. Um, and I often think, but should we? And I'm going back to Ellie's question about thinking about how do you deal with people that are maybe not engaging or aggressive about it is, I think it's both a, both a blessing and a curse that we live in a world where there are so many difference and differences and of opinions and so many different views. And you have to understand that not everybody, even though we would like to, because we're all people who are here sat thinking about sustainable leadership, not everybody is going to have that same view. Um, and sometimes we just can't change that. And unfortunately, I know that maybe sounds defeatist in itself. But if we argue with people's points constantly, even if we've kind of actively listened to them and tried to understand their point, that's just going to cause even more disengagement. And I think sometimes it is the case of just understanding and sitting there and being like, okay, we've spoken about this. You, un you 
you know, let's agree to disagree and move it forwards. And maybe just through sort of conversations every now and then they might begin to change their mind. But we do live in such a diverse world. And I think sometimes we need to understand this a little bit more. And I think some of this is highlighted um, by what's going on, you know, with everybody sat in front of cars and things. Is that how are these people who are you who you're blocking from going to school or job interviews? Is that engaging them with with your with your sort of cause, or are you just kind of annoying them and making them think you're just getting in the way of my everyday life? Um, so it's kind of thinking about actually how you know everybody has their own experience of how we're going to tackle these problems, and <laughs> you can't go about it in the same way for everyone. Um, so in in my research of environmental education and well-being, where a lot of people think actually just because they're nat in the natural environment, it's going to be good for them and it's going to be good for their well-being, but a lot of the kids were like, no, this is awful. I don't want to be here. But so my research was understanding, well, why is that? What, what is the point here? And it's because they've grown up in cities. That's where they're used to. And then they've come and gone into the middle of nowhere. And we're being like, have a great time. We all love it here. But that's our perspective. And I think as groups of people who come together as we all are, um, and this is what we want, but actually outside of this little bubble of people, there are people who don't really care about this. And we have to understand that and think about actually there are so many different perspectives in this world that we have to take into account and we can't you know just be like just because i think like this this is how everyone should think yeah thank you rachel um i'm just a bit conscious of time tom did you want to say something briefly then yeah i just wanted to mention the word disruption seeing as rachel was alluding to it and others have as well we we face a world full of disruption um, we are going to be disrupted in ways we can't even imagine. And it may happen tomorrow. It may happen in 20, 50 years time. We don't know. Um, so the disruption that people are causing right now to try and bring the level of this emergency to attention is this fine balance. And I really hear what you're saying, Rachel, between sounding an alarm, you know, and Will's talking about Greta Thunberg and or just staying a little bit quiet and hoping that we're going to get leadership from the top which has failed us for decades and decades and has got us to this this point so we live in desperate times and and we will all approach this in different ways and that's why listening uh, across difference is so key at this time thanks tom um i can see jonathan you've got your hand raised but i'm really yeah confident. sorry i don't want to um, keep people longer so i'll give you it, 20, 20 it seconds Thank you. It relates to some of the stuff that's already been said, and again to Ellie's question because um, you know coming across and some of the other things we've mentioned around as well is critical thinking. Um, a lot of themes that we've we've talked about, but we need to try and connect those dots. I think so. So those who perhaps don't believe that that's fine, but I think if you get them to think critically and say, you know, ask ask those smaller questions that affect them. So one of the things I did last week went up on the moors picking mushrooms for example well, if you can't do that if you can't go and surf if you can't go and do the things that you enjoy you know visit those sites that are, are are naturally amazing what's the point you know and if you get people to think about how it affects them in their small world you know then then that can that can um affect change you know having done sort of change management courses and things humans are naturally scared of change okay and and i think everything that we're talking about at the moment or a few things that we're talking about at the moment around a climate emergency are we really going to disappear is the planet going to disappear in 12 years time that's where people switch off i think in 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 changing their habits and 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 in saying to people okay you don't believe in the environmental crisis or the environmental issues you've just got to look at some of the pictures that are around of the destruction of the earth in mining and things like that. Now, if in, in trying to get people to, to follow you, I think if you get them to look at why would you want to waste resources, you know, and, and you could set, turn it into monetary value. But I think if you, if you can appeal to people's emotions in a way that is um, affect them rather than, scaring them and making them afraid um and naturally they'll then not understand that if they can't understand why they're supposed to be afraid again they're not gonna they're not gonna buy into it um and, and i think those lessons can be taken from business and leadership in in how you get your corporates and again where we talk about vision 
it is is not saying be scared, be afraid, taking away their hope. It's saying actually we can do something about this, and this is how you individually can can do that in in how you decide to buy things, in how you decide to make things, um, and in the companies that you use to for those services and goods, and and that then encourages those companies to make those changes to make it more appealing to the consumer which which we're already seeing and also what i think it's being quite disingenuous when we say that the government is can i just come sorry um sorry to cut you up but i'm just that's right of time i I can talk forever anyway (laughs) thanks thanks for your contribution what no it's, it's great what what i'm hearing is that um we can be all role models for positive change and one of the things i'm really passionate about leadership which maybe i think you were trying to allude to is that we have to and can like live our values and if we can be true leaders then we we need to not just talk about it but embody it and embrace it and live live our values but we can all be role models for positive change and i think that's one of the great opportunities of being a leader leader for positive change is that you know, it's all right having this conversation, but we, and which is fantastic, but, um, you know, there's no point talking about the future if it doesn't lead to action today. And um, that's something that really inspires me in terms of leadership. Um, so I'd love to just bring it to a close. And, I, and I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone being here today and, and sort of contributing and asking questions. Um, there were some questions that weren't answered and I'll pick those up as well. Um, so thank you for contributing. I'd love to just hear a, a snippet of three words um, and contribute in the chat for the audience. Um, if you can, three words to describe the type of world that you want to live in, in 10 years time. If you could place those three words in the chat, if, if you're part of the audience, but maybe we'll just skim round to the speakers, um, each of you, three words to describe the type of world you want to live in in 10 years' time. Michaela, could you kick us off? I'm going to go with five, people centre rather than profit centre. Perfect, thank you. Um, Oscar? I, uh, I would go for action, truth and equality. I'd go with flourishing coral reefs. It's a bit of marine biology now. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Rachel? Uh, um, I would say happiness, um, connectedness, um, and colourful. Brilliant. And uh, Tom? Aware, engaged, and aware. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and I think for me, it'd be, let's do this together. That's four, but um, I'm the host, so I can have four. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you all again. A really, really lovely discussion and would love to continue, but I'm aware that the skies are darkening and I'd love for you to get outside and embrace the autumn fresh air um, before, before the sun goes down. So thank you again. Um, This has been a wonderful conversation. We've got a range of stuff coming up uh, for Low Carbon Devon and we have an in-person event on the 1st of November, um, which is called Grey to Green here at the University of Plymouth. So if you're local and you want to come to that, um, we'll send out details of that following this event. Um, But that's what's coming up from us. and I just encourage you to to take some time to think, reflect, to be present and to, to enjoy the beautiful world around us. So thanks again to Tom, to Oscar and Will, uh, to Michaela and to Rachel and to thank you all for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of your, your day and hopefully see you soon. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you.